Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. Today we're talking with Mark Selko and Matt Glickman, the founders of BabyCenter.com. The story of BabyCenter is a combination of several themes that we've discussed on the show. For instance, creating community as a strategy for building a sustainable audience, attempting e-commerce in the 1990s and the challenges involved there, and most interestingly, we get into an in-depth discussion of their experiences of the height of the dot-com bubble. Please enjoy this conversation with Mark Selko and Matt Glickman. Matt Glickman, Mark Selko, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. So I've been told by listeners when I have more than one person on at a time, it's helpful to introduce one at a time so people can figure out whose voice is who. So uh, let's start with uh, Matt. Um, Matt, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And And then I made my way to the East Coast and then came out to uh, the West Coast in Silicon Valley for business school in the early 90s and have been here since. Mark, how about you? I grew up in West Hartford, Connecticut, and I moved to the San Francisco area in 1987, which is the year I finished college on the East Coast. So I believe that you guys met each other at uh, business school, Stanford Business School, is that right? That's right. We were in a decision trees and data modeling class. Matt was one row in front of me in kind of a tiered uh, auditorium and they wanted us to form study groups and I looked down and the back of his head looked like an intelligent head so I said I'll work with that guy Is that how you remember it um, I yeah vaguely what was uh, Mark didn't make as much of an impression on one of the other just four of us sitting together and um, one of the four uh, was the um, uh, most recent uh, women's uh, Ironman world champion. So that probably made more of an impression. <laughs> did you, um, did, did one or both of you study under Jim Collins, the, the good to great guy? It's funny you mentioned that. The Iron Man winner was Jim Collins' wife. And uh, we, uh, I did. I, I was in Jim's class, which was, I had a big impression on me and stayed in touch with him after school as well. So I, I do want to touch a little bit on, on your early careers. Um, uh, Mark, you basically only at Amgen before you started Baby Center, is that right? You know, before Stanford, where Matt and I met, I had worked in the biotech industry mm-hmm. for a few years at a series of companies in the Bay Area. And then Amgen was after business school. So I had, I don't know, eight or nine years working and product management and marketing positions in the biotech industry. And Matt convinced me to change to IT and internet. So thanks, Matt. It was a good call. And Matt, you, uh, you had a couple of different things. Uh, you were a consultant. Were you, uh, and, uh, at Teach for America, maybe around the time when they start Teach for America? Yeah, I was, uh, I was a management consultant for three years, and then I went to work at Teach for America. I didn't teach. I was on the staff. I was brought in as the CFO, the second CFO. Everyone was one year out of college, and I was three years out of college, so I was kind of the gray-haired person with experience, and I did actually have a little bit of gray hair then. Um, and uh, ironically, I mean, it was great experience, and I've, I've done work in education since, but ironically, it was an entrepreneurial nonprofit, and I didn't really know much about entrepreneurship, and I'd say doing some of the fun things like opening new offices uh, where we were going to place teachers is very entrepreneurial, and it, I think, in some ways, pointed me on the path um, that I'm on today. Um, and you did a little bit of time at, at Intuit as well, right? Yeah, so I so I was a consultant and I worked at a nonprofit. I came to business school. I always thought I'd go back to the Midwest and run a small manufacturing company. I like smaller businesses. Um, and again, didn't really know about entrepreneurship. Back in the day, I remember there was a guy at Bain who was an entrepreneur. And the entrepreneurs were the people who just came up with 100 ideas a day and you know crazy stuff. And that didn't seem like me. So I never thought of myself as, as an entrepreneur particularly. So... Uh, when I came to Stanford, I thought I would just spend a few years out here. And I realized I didn't really have marketing. Product management didn't even uh, wasn't really a concept I knew of or many people did. And so I just said, look, it would be great to get some good marketing experience. And actually, also, ironically, um, 
being the CFO at Teach for America, they were using Quicken, and I transitioned them to a business product, but I learned about the company, and at that point, it was a very small company, still private, and I thought it'd be a great place to learn. And that's really what got me into uh, basically technology um, and entrepreneurship and made me realize that we actually, could, you know, just as creative and interesting to build um, software products as it would be to do, you know, manufacture real products. And uh, again, as Mark said later, where I wooed him into tech, I was really only three years of tech experience myself, you know, all after, after business school. So who is it that gets the ball rolling um, to start Baby Center? Uh, take me take me through uh, basically the idea gestation. Are you guys maybe just thinking of doing something on the internet and then stumble upon Baby Center? Tell me the story. Yeah, we'll back it up because it really predates the internet. You know, we're that fortunate generation that was just sort of just before technology. I mean, Mark was probably the same way as the last year where you showed up at college with a typewriter instead of a computer. And actually, remember the second year of business school in the spring is uh, John Zeitlin. Uh, Classmate is now involved in technology as well. I remember him running across the closet saying, got to check out this thing. Like you can access the internet through a browser. It's coming out soon. And so we were really at the forefront of it. And at that point I had no idea. I don't think either of us did that we were going to do something with the internet. We really set out. There's an, another professor along with Jim Collins named Irv Grosbeck, who was a great mentor. And, you know, his model was more, his model of entrepreneurship was more the search fund model where you could go out and find an existing business and buy it and be entrepreneurial and grow it. So I think we were probably more in that mode of, uh, hey, let's, um, uh, you know, let's actually go find a business to buy. Maybe we'll find something to start. And we looked at all different kind of businesses. We came out of school with the old days, so we said we've got to get some work experience. Um, and so our path was uh, three years after we got out of school, we would, you know, quit whatever job we had and, and, and start a company, uh, start a company then. And um, uh I think our first couple of ideas for the first year or so, we didn't really do anything. And then we started batting ideas around and we had a real estate idea. Um, and then I think probably just because I was adding to it, I started tossing more technology ideas out there. Um, Mark, I think when we had a small business idea, basically like a small business health marketplace idea that probably could work today, but wouldn't have worked then. And Baby Center was probably the third or fourth idea we came after. And it really came out of, uh, I was in, Intuit, Scott Cook was the chairman of Intuit at the time. He's a great mentor. He was like, he came out of PNG and he really brought a lot of the consumer tenets that probably now exist in things like design thinking of think really deeply about the consumer and build a product around them and shape the technology to the actual consumer needs. And uh, when the internet came out, it started in you know, the mid nineties started um, coming on the scene. He was always coming up with new ideas and brainstorming where the company could go. And I remember one of his insights as a marketer was that, you know, life events, when you have a life event, it's a really powerful time. Your, your, your mind's open to new things. And so he said, how could we use the Internet to, you know, take advantage of life events? And, and in two that was mainly around buying a house because it was a financial company. But because Mark and I were in the mode of trying to think of, you know, companies to start, I remember going to the meeting, you know, oh, graduate high, college, uh, high school, graduate college, first job, you know. Uh, buy a house, you know, marry, buy a house, have kids. And that's when I realized, hey, there's actually nothing, you know, uh, on the Internet about that. My wife and I are probably a year or so away from having kids. And I remember thinking, I just know nothing about this. I've never even seen a baby store. You just don't look at that when you're single. And at that point, that was the era of Netscape. Uh, and I think Healthscape was started right after that by Jim Clark. So I remember calling Mark and saying, hey, I have our idea. It's Babyscape, mm. which is just everything for babies on the Internet. Mark, what's your what's your recollection? Yeah, I I remember there being, you know, three or four main ingredients in this uh, in this soup. You know, uh, like Matt, I didn't intend to be an entrepreneur. I wanted to, uh, you know, grow and be a CEO of a biotech company. And then over the course of the business school experience, you know, my mind was open, being in Silicon Valley and seeing what was possible. And you know, so I still stayed with my main plan and. I remember ingredient one was, uh, you know, meeting Matt and realizing, hey, we could buy a business or start a business. I, I could deviate from this plan and that could be really fulfilling. Ingredient number two was the arrival of the Internet. And I vividly remember my first experience with it. I got together with an old friend from summer camp in New Hampshire and he was a developer and it was 1994 and he had this little apartment in the San Fernando Valley. I was living in Santa Monica when I worked at Amgen and he said, you got to see this thing, the internet. And we looked up U2 album covers mm. and, you know, they painted on the screen excruciatingly slowly, but I just thought it was uh, massive. 
so, uh, you know, I was interested. And then, you know, Matt also saw this, you know, big, big change in the landscape. And then the third, I, I loved and did and still do ideas of influencing health and health outcomes. And, you know, we were starting to do direct to consumer work at Amgen. And I uh, had a big role in a program where we were advertising and creating documentaries and working directly with cancer patients. And I thought, you know, reaching consumers about their health through the internet and starting a company. So that was sort of ingredient three. And, um, you know, Matt and I uh, had gone on this trip at the end of business school where uh, we rented an RV and traveled around the Southwest. And in uh, Yosemite Park on the Merced River, we shook hands and said, let's get some experience and pay down our debts and let's do something years later. And, you know, it all kind of came together around the time of baby center and, uh, you know, just to, you know, wrap this up, I wanted to do something with consumer health. Matt had this experience around life transitions he had just talked about. So, uh, you know, birth of a child, particularly a first child, met the criteria in the internet just seemed like this really powerful way to deliver, you know, stage specific point in time specific information. And we began researching that idea. Uh, I believe you launch in, in, um, a spare bedroom of, of Matt's house. Oh, and I was living in the other spare bedroom. Ah. So it was, uh, it was crowded. It's true. We, um, yeah, at this you know, point we, Mark had, Mark was down in LA. So, you know, we had a room, uh, back up here and, uh, you know, we were trying to save all the money we could to start the company. So we, we did it out of my, um, uh, house, which was actually just right near downtown Palo Alto, and it had an address that looked like a business address, so it actually gave us some credibility. It looked like we already had an office in downtown Palo Alto. So you, you identify that there's not a lot being done in this parenting space, this you know, expectant uh, mother-father space, and so what is your original vision? Is it sort of like an information site that you want to launch, a community site? What, what's the original vision that, that you start out to build? Well, the original yeah, it really vision, was like what Mark said. Though. Go ahead, Mark. Oh yeah. Well, it, it, first of all, I want to step back. We were first-time entrepreneurs. We were, I don't know, thirty, thirty-one. Um, you know, which was young for those days. I guess it's old now. And you know, we thought the right thing to do was a massive amount of research, and we wrote this huge, you know, phone book style business plan. And, you know, I don't, nobody does that anymore. And, um, you know, we didn't do it for our second company either. But, you know, I guess we were anxious and we wanted to seem credible. But the outgrowth of that research effort was a model that actually worked for us. And it had three parts, uh, you know, a publishing part, which was delivering content. And I'm sure we'll talk here about the different and novel ways we delivered that content. That would be an advertising supported business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a store. You know, like a catalog, that was the proxy. That's that was the analog, right? Uh, it was e-commerce. You know, it was just beginning to be branded, so we would sell products. And then the third was a healthcare component, where we would um, deliver health content to whether it was a you know multi-specialty provider group or a health plan that wanted to reach pregnant women and make sure that they got their prenatal care and carried to full term. We figured since we had all this stage specific information and medical experts, we'd have this three part business plan and it would create this kind of virtuous loop. And that's actually what was in the business plan. And that's that's what we built. Matt. Yeah, it's funny, Mark was talking about the business plan. Like, actually, I think everyone did in the most days, particularly anxious first time entrepreneurs. And I have it in front of me. It's a 60 page bound document that you do at, at, uh, at Kinko's. And, um, you know, we were talking on that, uh, just before we started recording here, Brian, you mentioned people like Steve case from the past We We, we had a Steve case quote around consumer marketing. We had a, a healthcare services line of the business. Um, and we talked about life event change and there was pages and pages of all the things that we would, um, uh, we would do. And the interesting thing at that point is there was a lot of investment and the consumer internet was, uh, you know, was a real thing. Like, um, InfoSeek and Yahoo, and I think, no, maybe not Lycos, InfoSeek and Yahoo had gone public. And so there was this thought that there was, you know, consumer internet businesses. But then there was, as we started, there was this backlash that, oh, that was just a hype cycle and we can't really make money uh, with consumers on the internet. So 
for us, it was actually a challenging time to get started. People liked the idea in general, and they were intrigued, and we got a lot of venture meetings, but it was really, really hard to get people over the finish line uh, to commit, and that's part of how the uh, business plan kept growing. Every objection, you know, we heard we'd add five more pages to address that objection. You know, I'd, I'd like to go into that just a little bit. Um, so, and, and also, we, we should probably frame it in time. So this is um, 1996, roughly, that, that you're starting to put this together? That's right. Uh, yeah. Yes, it was, yeah, late 96. Okay, late 96. So, you know, uh, people tend to look back at, at the dot-com era, especially, and think of it all as um, e-commerce dot-coms and things like that. But So you, you just mentioned that there were these mini, wave, mini waves and mini fads in within this period where um, eventually, yes, there's a ton of, of consumer-facing e-commerce startups, but... You're saying that when you start trying to, to raise money, um, that's sort of a fad that it had gone out a little bit? Well, yeah, there were at that point, there wasn't fads. even really a... You know, Matt, the, 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 no, I don't know if you remember this, but we, you know, we were not having great success initially with our first wave of fundraising. And a friend told us, it's because you don't have a push strategy and, you know, point cast had right, come and right. rocket ship. And, you know, you need to go get the URL baby channel and talk about your, your push plans. And so, of course, we did. And we got the URL and we wrote about baby, you know, baby channel and our push strategy. And nobody cared. And that fad went. But, you know, it was early days and no one knew what was what was going to take. It's funny. I was going to bring up that thing, this point cast and, and push. Brian, you should, you should talk about it's like an obscure World War One battle that no one covers anymore. But Pointcast was probably, it wasn't a unicorn. I think it ended up being worth five hundred million at one point, and right. they turned down that offer, and that made it famous. But it was the first big company, and and then you know the, all the venture guys were like, that's you know you people aren't going to seek out information. You you know it's going to be pushed to you, and it, it influenced a bunch of companies like us that we had to sort of adapt to their strategy. And then of course it fizzled out a couple of years later. Well, also but the other interesting thing is there really wasn't a sorry there wasn't a distinction then between you know. Uh, e-commerce and content and, and all that stuff. And when we started um, with Baby Center, one of our, you always have these huge naive assumptions as a, um, as an entrepreneur. So we knew we were going to build a, basically an information site and pregnancy and baby information, and that would be a media business. But we also said we're going to put that together with not only the health component that Mark talked about, health information component, but also a store, and that we were going to build the Amazon of, you know, baby products and, you know, strollers and, and baby toys and things like that. And at that point, Amazon was books only. And we thought, oh, we're going to do what Amazon did. We're going to go find a distributor, hook up to them, and offer all the products. And it was probably only after we raised money that we realized, oh, there is no distributor. It's going to be real hard hard work to do that. So we actually put the store on hold for about, I think, a year and a half or so. And we just focused on the media business. And then about a year and a half later, I remember when you talk about the waves, then there was this big wave in 97, 98, where e-commerce was going to be huge. And all these venture investors who had been ignoring us then came to us and said, you know, they're throwing money at us and saying, you got to drop this, you know, cute little media property and just build a big uh, baby store. And, uh, and, and then we did that. And so we added that um, land to the stool at that point. So who, who were the, the VCs that eventually got on board with you guys? Well, we had in our first round. Did mainly an angel. Yeah, in the seed round, we had uh, a small venture fund was created out of Broderbund Software, and they, um, you know, set the price. And then it was friends and family and angels, and we uh, built a small team off of that. That closed in early 1997, and you know, within six months, it was you know starting to happen and come together. And then we raised uh, our first real institutional round from two, at that time, lesser known investors. It was IDG Ventures. And Matt, what was the name of the other the other guys from Cleveland? It was Chris, yeah, Crystal Internet Ventures. Crystal, that's it. But really, was IDG Ventures was known as, uh, you know, they were that, uh, like the PC world and info world. And they looked at it and said, you know, we have all these special communities around, you know, different um, technology communities and hey, why, you know, the baby community from a business perspective kind of looks at that. So they were actually on the forefront at a time when it was, with our first institutional round, it still really wasn't um, internet, consumer internet companies weren't in favor. Um, so they were kind of looking ahead and applying some you know, kind of unique insights from their business and, and it worked. 
So I believe that you launched the site in, in November of 97. And I have, I have two questions about that. First of all, I always like to ask, even if you can find it on archive.org, sometimes you can't. So um, tell me if, if I went to visit Baby Center in November of 1997, what, what would I have seen? You would have seen you know, something uh, popular today. People talk about minimum viable products. We did it just out of pure necessity, not out of any grand plan. It was a very simple looking, uh, ugly page of, you know, that basically outlined the core, you know, topic areas that people would care about when they're pregnant or have a new baby. And then there was this very start of what actually proved to be the most popular part of uh, Baby Center, which was stage related information. Um, so there were stage pages, we called them, that literally were every week of pregnancy, um, you know, week, um, you know, from, from the beginning all the way up to week 40, and then every week of the baby's first life and then eventually uh, months. And it was, it was just deep, high quality um, information, the kind you'd find in a book, but we, you could go much deeper because the internet was unlimited. Okay, my, my second question would be, um, this is 1997, so there's no product hunt, there's no you know, <laughs> universe of tech blogs. So when you launch uh, a new site in 1997, uh, how do people find out about it? How, how, do you, how do you start to grow a user base? You know, it was um, it was mainly a word of mouth thing. We we chose the category in large part because the information seeking behavior of a first time mom, and you know, a dad to a lesser extent, was really intense. And you know, we you know built our our product around around the idea that if we did something that was high quality, so we hired real editors and real writers, and we assembled a, a qualified medical advisory board. We even though it was minimum viable and thin, it was it was decent quality, and of course it got a lot better. And you know, people started sharing and spreading it around. You know, I remember doing some keyword purchase. You know, in those days, it was probably all on Yahoo, mm -hmm. um, maybe MSN. I can't remember, but we um, I, I don't know that that was so productive for us. Although we kept doing it, and you know, the word spread. And you know, I remember marveling at you know, feedback or someone would be in one of the communities or someone would sign up for the newsletter and they'd be in North Dakota. And we're like, how did that happen? And it just uh, grew or grew organically. You know, it's actually really not that different today. I mean, we grew, like eBay did that you know, on a much, much larger scale, maybe six months to a year ahead of us. Um, you know, if you have the right product at the right time for a motivated audience, um, word spreads just organically and, and virally. And, you know, that happened with Instagram. It happened with Pinterest today. So it's actually still, I think, the way most um, kind of consumer brands uh, get started. And you know, one other thing we tried, you know, partly with my medical background, you know, we exhibited at the American Academy of Pediatrics and the College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and, you know, thinking that you know, if your OB thought this would really be helpful, you know, he or she would spread the word to their patients. But in 1997, the feedback we'd get at our booth was either disinterest or mild contempt. You know, people didn't think the internet was a great place for their patients to go. And, you know, that's changed a lot. Um, and occasionally there'd be a young physician who would come around and say, tell me more, this is interesting, this could be helpful. But that was the exception. So that whole strategy for getting people to our, our site really didn't work in those days. Well, that, that makes me wonder then, um, maybe not at launch, but you know, more as you're growing, where are you getting your content from? We developed We originally it. thought we would just license it, yeah, that we would just, you know, find book and, and, and buy it. We hired editors. We went out and said, we don't know anything about this. And so primarily we hired editors from parenting magazines. Um, and, uh, and just wrote all the content ourselves and we put together a medical advisory board to review it. So we had kind of both well-written stuff that had nice voice and tone, but it was also authoritative. And again, that was a big chunk of work. It took a lot, a lot of our staff and a lot of time. And, uh, now it's, you know, it's kind of an authoritative complete, mm -hmm. um, based on I think one reason the baby center still is the leading site out there and hasn't been disrupted is that if you, you know, go to a search engine today to Google for any baby problem, like you'll get to a piece of our content usually first. You know, there was a piece of good luck we had. Parenting Magazine was based in San Francisco and was owned by Time Warner. And I, I can't remember the specific details, but they were closing the office and a lot of people were moving to other time properties. And, you know, that's right when we were hiring our team. So we just had ready access to experienced editors in the category who knew a lot of freelance writers and, you, you know, 
it, it wasn't that hard for us to go get a small kind of nucleus of a team who were experienced. What about um, community? Uh, do you have uh, message boards early on, uh, the ability for, for uh, users of your site to, to interact with each other? Yeah, we, that was actually, uh, you know, content, commerce, and community were the three, we had a couple different three-legged stools. And um, so we first got the content out there, but then very quickly we started adding discussion forums. And so pretty much every article had it. And we also then started, you know, creating, we had to actually think of like, what's the right bulletin board structure that would, you know, entice people? Because a lot of bulletin boards on the internet then were just sort of empty because, you know, just this echo chamber. And so, you know, one, we created a, we created monthly birth groups, which are still the most popular way to do it. So anyone who was having a, you know, July 1998 baby would join the group and good things would happen. And then there'd be a lot of special interest topics if you wanted to talk about, um, you know, natural parenting or, you know, or there's a certain um, condition your baby had, there'd be groups that would form around that as well. And uh, all of these things were new when we did it. I remember, you know, Mark talked about we hired these parenting magazine editors you know, the core insight we had with the internet is that you could actually reach someone when they were 26 weeks pregnant and think about exactly what they're going through at that moment. It was super hard to get editors who had already had babies themselves to like think that precisely. Mm. Um, but we ultimately did that. And then the same thing existed with bulletin boards. Like you have to be super, super precise and get people on like ex the exact topic that they're obsessing about at the moment. Um, the, uh, you, so for the first year you said it's, it's mostly this content um, supported by advertising. So uh, tell me a little bit about that. Was it easy to get brands to, to work with you or were you still early enough that maybe you had to convince Pampers that the internet was a place that they should maybe start experimenting with? Yeah. So, you know, this is Mark. I was the road warrior in those days and it was, um, you know, fascinatingly variable. Uh, you know, I remember before we'd launched, you know, we had any reason for anyone to believe we were going to launch, uh, went on the road and met with, you know, the major brands and some like the junior brand manager from Pampers who became a very good friend, uh, just said yes to it. We, well, first we had to design a program. We came up with these charter sponsorships and, you know, that was one meeting, one sponsor. And in contrast, I, I don't know, there were eight to 10 trips to New Brunswick, New Jersey, to meet with increasingly senior people at Johnson and Johnson for the same $50,000. And, <laughs> you know, it was, um, just vastly different model of making a decision about doing something new. The junior brand manager had the authority to experiment and try a P and G, but at J and J, this was so close to their equity around mom and baby. It was considered possibly risky. So they had to be careful in the end. We got them both. And, you know, I can remember, you know, visiting other companies where, you know, eight to 10 trips and it was a no or no answer. And others like Tums at Smith Klein Beecham in, in Pittsburgh was also like a two meeting. Yes. So, um, but we, you know, we learned early on that just not only trying to construct something of value, the way people conventionally measure it, like impressions and reach would work, but also, Hey, get in, learn, figure out how the internet operates you know, you, you, you can be the brand within your, your company that gets that learning value. So we offered uh, consumer research and microsites and all these products that were designed around um, a learning orientation. And that, that was really effective. And, and I thought we were pretty creative in, in coming up with that. The, um, the move to, to do commerce, I mean, seems obvious, especially in retrospect. Um, but obviously you guys didn't have a competency with that. And, and also, again, this is early days where, you know, today there's plug and play programs for people to add commerce to any number of platforms. So, um, when the, when the shift to adding commerce happens, how, how do you get the ball rolling on that? Yeah. Well, it was funny. I remember some investors saying, you guys aren't e-commerce guys, you're media guys. And we've been in the media business for a grand total of 18 months you know, <laughs> before that we were in software and, and biotech. So we're like, well, we'll figure it out. Um, it was always in our plan. So I think we, we uh, you know, again, like we didn't know what we were doing when we got in the media business. We figured it out. So we, you know, we thought, okay, we're good at figuring out. We don't know what we're doing. So, we, but you have it exactly right at that point. I mean, we literally, we had to do and build everything. So we had to, uh, we literally did a deal with a local baby store called Lullaby Lane because we couldn't afford to buy all the inventory. You couldn't really raise a lot of capital then. So our first 
uh, e-commerce, uh, you know, warehouse was a store where we'd send people down the aisles with a shopping cart and, you know, pick things up and, and we'd, uh, we'd pack it in the back room. I remember one horrified venture capitalist who was going to invest in us was looking at like, this is your e-commerce operation. This is scary. <laughs> but actually, just like with the uh, media site, it just started growing like crazy. And, you know, I, I remember we're like, oh, my gosh, we don't have room to wrap in this store. And we rented an empty storefront next door. And then three months later, we found a warehouse, which where the new San Francisco ballpark is, that area was all going to be condemned for the ballpark. So we're actually able to get a ton of space really cheaply because it was going to be torn down in two years. And we, we didn't look more than three months ahead. So we were happy to take that bet. So we literally had to build our own warehouse. And then we looked at all the software out there from picking and packing software to e-commerce software to payment software, and none of it existed. So we actually had a pretty sprawling operation. We had to build that all ourselves and, you know, learn all the hard lessons. And every once in a while we try a traditional like warehouse software package but it just hadn't been even the catalog ones hadn't yet adapted to the particularities of the internet so it was a very different and challenging time it's much much easier to do it today but we made it work well we did have one starter program remember internet baby in san diego matt we yeah, had yeah, an was, yeah. store when we launched our product and we were just selling advertising we also sent referrals to uh, someone who had created an a online baby store before we did, and they were the owner, owner of the biggest baby retail, brick-and-mortar retail operation in San Diego. So we were able to learn somewhat about what categories were likely to move, and you know, we went to the big juvenile products conference in Dallas to see who were the manufacturers, and we started building our knowledge. And then phase two was working with Lullaby Lane here in San Bruno, and you know, Matt's right. We had to build so much, but in those days, an order would come, and then you know, someone would go to the, go down the aisle, pick the product, pick the right box to put it in that had our sticker on it. Um, but it worked. Uh, regular listeners. I mean, the real skepticism came at. Sorry. Uh, the ahead. real skepticism came at that point. Media businesses. You know, there was a huge, you know, separation of church and state between you know, media and advertising and, and the whole idea of having media and commerce together was really controversial. So a lot of the more traditional media people thought, you know, you can't do this, you're going to lose credibility, you're going to ruin your brand, you're going to, you know, um, compromise it. And our view was, hey, we're going to keep them separate, just like, you know, um, media companies keep the, you know, the, 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 the editorial and the business side separate. We can do the same thing with commerce, which we, we did. And our core insight was that consumers don't really separate it in their mind. Like they were getting tired of reading these stories like, you know, here are baby products you need, or here's how to baby proof your house, and then you couldn't find where to buy the products. So uh, that was a bet at the time, and I think it's one now that's, you know, uh, reasonably standard out there, but um, it's quite controversial in the day. Well, uh, uh, regular listeners of the show know that I like to harp on a lot of, about the fact that people forget that um, it, it was a hard slog to make e commerce a thing, and, and even when researching. Um, you guys, I found an article that mentioned you from 1999 that still says, you know, two thirds of, of consumers are, are uh, you know, worried about putting their credit card numbers online. So I wonder if, if you guys had any any memories of that, of, of you know, basically <laughs> convincing not not VCs, but consumers that that buying online was was a viable thing. Well, you know, this was in our business plan. Of course, it was conjecture, but we, you know, we had some evidence. You know, there were a couple thoughts. One was, you know, when when you're pregnant, especially later in pregnancy, or you have an infant, it's a hassle to go to the store. And you know, so there was a thriving catalog industry, you know, around baby products, and that, you know, we had data on catalog sales and could see that it was a, a thriving, successful, reasonably high margin area. So would people go on the internet? Well, you know, catalog was an indication, number one. Number two, we had organized all of our content around these gestational stages and stage of, you know, baby's life. It, but, uh, you know, people bought products by age and stage as well. You know, you get to a certain week of pregnancy and that's when you need the car seat and that's when you need to buy the minivan and that's when you need... Um, you know, a range of different products and, you know, the merchandisers and the manufacturers well, the manufacturers in particular really wanted to market by age and stage. So we thought we could offer a better retail experience by offering that granularity. So these were two big ideas that we thought would help persuade people. In the end, we just had to go do it and prove it. And, and it, it, you know, bore out. Um, but we, th those were the indications that this could be a really good e-commerce category. 
we in the early days, everyone had to do this. We would say, call us if you're not comfortable putting your credit card in and people would call and, you know, you'd write the credit card and the number down the old fashioned way. Um, this is also the days I'm thinking 1998 into 1999. This is the days of the portal wars <laughs> and also, you know, AOL is such a, a big player at this point. So I got to imagine that you were amongst the people uh, slugging it out, trying to become, say, the the you know the official partner of Excite for baby stuff or or for Yahoo or for for AOL. So um, t- tell me a little bit about that. Right. Well, this is actually really we were one of the, the things about how we ran the company and starting it earlier where we didn't raise a lot of money is we were always really frugal. I mean, we just raised a couple million dollars and we were just you know we would do things that worked. And I remember AOL started swinging around and there was. Um, guy you know, with the slicked back hair was trying to tell us how, you know, here's the playbook, we're going to make your company, you're going to spend $10 million on this. And we didn't have more than a couple million dollars then. And we just wouldn't do it. And, you know, we were like, well, we can make it work this way and that and just try to make it a real deal. And I remember that guy who was, you know, whenever one of the really senior guys today, I all called one of their, you know, our board members and said, are, are your are the data center guys posturing? Like, they just couldn't believe that we would turn down a deal. But um, at that point, we had been doing well enough as a company, and our investors were behind us. They kind of cheered for us because we were the one, you know, one group that wasn't, you know, doing these kind of crazy deals, and we were doing well enough that they were willing to, to stand behind us. So, yeah, we tried, and I think we had a few. I think we did one with Excite in the very early days where there wasn't money changing hands, but um, we got in a situation where we were the fish out of water where, you know, we wouldn't, we wouldn't step up to, uh, to play, and we'll get to that in a later chapter. One of the company that ended up acquiring us did that kind of stuff. Mark, was that, I mean, was that a big deal in those days? Like, you know, uh, traffic from AOL was basically like the traffic from Google today. Like you had to, you had to be there to, to, to be noticed. You know, there was increasing pressure to do the AOL deal. And, you know, people were raising rounds of venture capital expressly to do their AOL deal. And AOL was selling their media packages around, you know, break through, make your mark, be the you know, you know, own your category on AOL. And like Matt said, we just didn't feel the huge amount of pressure to do it. We did do a deal with AOL. I remember uh, it was really small by their standards. And, um, you know, I'm glad it was small because it really underperformed uh, despite their hy- hype and, and selling. And yeah, I remember it the way Matt, Matt said it. We, first of all, yeah, we just couldn't afford it. Second of all, we were skeptical. And we were also, we had cracked something really valuable um, pe- people really wanted to reach women during pregnancy. That's a, you know, a lot of um, key brand decisions get made and brand loyalty forms and products are, are chosen. But the way marketers in the category reach pregnant women was uh, usually only after, well, it's not pregnant women, they'd, they'd get names from the in-hospital photo service that turned into a list and you'd reach people by month three or four of baby's life. And we were reaching people during pregnancy really successfully and, you know, it made us really valuable. So we just didn't feel we needed to. You know, yeah, um, I mean, that, the, AOL was not like Google then. AOL actually, I think like their initial deal with whoever it was had a lot of traffic and it worked. But then the real purpose of an AOL deal was so you could go out and raise money. That's what led to the bubble. So it was really about the mentioning venture people that you were the, the winner in that category. Um, but unlike Google today, the, the traffic just um, didn't follow. You know, and as Mark said, not only were we growing organically, but we should talk about it at some point when PR then took off for us because babies were this cute thing and we could get a lot of coverage. And if you want to, we can go into that because we sure, sure. had go a right whole ahead. lot of PR. And, um, hey, so, Matt. Not was, so we basically was, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there's one element of the product we haven't talked about, which, uh, you know, was driven by Matt with his product background, and that's tools. So we had content to store, this health content, but we also created a baby name finder we created uh, um, the sports conflict catcher. I'll come back to that one, which was really a PR strategy. But you know what you could use the medium for that magazine and book people often overlook was um, you know this software-like tool experience and finding your baby's name, uh, you know, is a major major topic of interest for for our audience. And they would come for dozens or hundreds of page views and spend, I don't, you know many, many minutes, if not hours. And, you know, we could just keep enriching that tool first with a library of names, then a historical archive, then, you know, various, you know, ethnic and national origins and syllables. So if you wanted to find a 
Gaelic girl's name that doesn't end in A that was popular in the 1890s, you could find it on Baby Center. And that not only was a great way to get people having a great experience on our on our product, but it generated a lot of PR force. And it still does for Baby Center. I'm, you know, I get alerts about stories on the baby name finder. I just got one last week. Well, and also you're speaking of software and, and interactive tools. I mean, you can do things like, you know, calculating the due date, uh, budgeting or, or, you know, budgeting for savings for college and things like that. And we did all of those things. Yeah, we said, yeah. for college was the Schwab. Yeah, Mark, you should tell them, Mark. Yeah. You got to tell. So basically we did the PR, you know, the, the PR thing of getting the word out there. And like we mentioned, baby names was a huge tool that we had. And like, it's amazing how much time people end up picking a baby name. And then that led to PR. We found this anonymistician, I think it's called. He's like the one academic who studies baby names. Actually, it's a guy like named Cleveland Amory. He grew up in Buffalo, New York. So he's always made fun of for his name. And then he would study how names grew. And so we, that's why every year to this day, Baby Center puts out the, the top baby names. So we got a lot of PR for that. But then we started reaching, like, how can we keep this PR thing going? So, Mark, you can tell the story because I think that was your idea of the, uh, uh, the, the sports conflict. Happening. Yeah. That was a creative well, tool that was more written about than used. We were looking for PR, but also we, um, we had all this content we were creating for dads. And we were bemoaning the fact that, you know, not that many dads were coming on to Baby Center and we wanted more of them. So uh, we had the idea of a tool that if you put in your uh, due date, it will tell you every major sporting event in the world that you're going to miss. <laughs> you're going to be in the in delivery room. And, you know, it was like the Cricket World Cup or the, you know, men's field hockey, Commonwealth Games. And, you know, everything was there. And so we just kept going and we put in the conception blocker. So you could um, you could figure out what sporting event you couldn't miss, like, oh, you know, no. Stanley Cup finals. And it would tell you when not to have sex with your wife. <laughs> And uh, we got on ESPN <laughs> for that one, and we thought that was a real PR win, and um, it was, but I don't know that it made a dent on getting more dads to come and sign up for the newsletter and become more engaged uh, partners while their wife was pregnant. I'm not sure we accomplished that. Well, and we, we got business uh, thing, but I'm still paying for it in that uh, we, were, um, we were delivering our first child, and it was during Final Four, and someone was, I was doing a press interview, I think literally from the hospital. We were working like crazy then. And someone's like, oh, are you a big Final Four person? Is this why, you know, you created this sports conflict hasher so other dads like you don't have to miss the, the Final Four? And I really wasn't a big Final Four thing, but of course, for press, I had to say it. So my wife to this day hasn't forgiven me 18 years later that I would, uh, you know, throw my newborn uh, baby under the bus to get PR for our company. Well, so we, we, let's stipulate that, that you guys succeed in, in, in growing this audience and you're, you're the 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 leading brand in the space and it's it, 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 it's always funny to to go back <laughs> with with hindsight and you know i found press releases where you guys are touting you know that you have millions of page views per month and things like that which seems like small numbers now and page views not necessarily visitors even um but was a were, were huge numbers for the time so you you do succeed in in basically uh being the king of this of the space right well what's funny is at the time our biggest competitors became these two women sites, iVillage and Women.com, which had raised tens of millions and then I think over a hundred million dollars. And it was funny because we were two guys running a baby company, and we were saying baby's just different, pregnancy and baby is different. You're not going to go to a general women site. Um, plus, we built a product, like Mark said, we had baby neighbors, we had personalized emails and information. Um, but the situation we found ourselves in is we were doing really well as a company and growing a lot, you know, by the numbers of, of those um, times. But the competitors around us were just kept raising more and more money. So actually for us, the, we were in that interesting situation where like the business is going well, but we're this tiny little player. And actually that led us ultimately to where the company got acquired to where we said we've got to go out and find a, some sort of partner, whether it's an investor or a big media or you know, a company just to have um, some heft in our court in case we can't compete against these you know, companies that have. Okay. Well, let's, you know, let's, let's get to that story then. Um, so, I, I mean, is is there thought of, of doing an IPO yourself? There has to be if this is ninety eight ninety nine, right? And there was, yeah. We well, had. We were... I remember we laying out the options with our with our board. And remember, this happened so quickly. It was, you know, the summer of ninety six. We have the idea. You know, we launch in the fall of ninety seven. Ninety eight, we launched the store, and you know, by I don't know the winter, early spring of ninety nine you know, we're winning in our category, but we have these competitors raising tens and tens of millions. 
and we were being approached by bankers and our investors were saying, you know, you guys can go public later this year. So our options were, you know, raise a lot of money privately and compete, raise money in the public markets and compete or, uh, you know, merge into someone bigger and, you know, compete that way. And we did discuss all, all of those options. Um, so how, wh- why, why end up with, uh, with eToys? I mean, I, having said that, that seems like the obvious, uh, the obvious partnership here, but uh, uh, tell me how you got to that place. Yeah, well, as Mark said, this all happened really quickly. I think it was even late 98. So this is like two months after we launched a store and raised at that point $10 million or a big round that we thought we'd raise five that we weren't even spending. And uh, we got Trinity and Bessemer and Intel and a bunch of investors in. And so, again, we went out to say who should be our, our partner at this point before we went public. We didn't really want to sell. We wanted, we were like, this is fun. We're going to get a chance to build a public company. We were young enough. We didn't hear the downsides of running a public company. So that was kind of our, our goal. And uh, I remember within about like, while we're running, you know, the business and working really hard, we went out and we found Amarindo, which was this, the big, you know, internet investor of the day. Um, we talked to Disney because I had had a connection with the head of the internet group from my Intuit days. Um, we talked to uh, Amazon. I think there was, uh, and then and we had an investor in common with Etoy, so we talked to all four of those parties. But we really actually weren't that interested in talking to Etoys because we didn't want to sell. So very quickly we had these basically large minority investments from an investor, from Amazon, you know, from, from Disney. And uh, I think we weren't smart enough to realize this, but eToys realized, wait, if, you know, an Amazon or someone or Disney, um, but particularly Amazon gets their, you know, builds a relationship with Baby Center, you know, they sell toys starting usually the parents of two-year-olds. And if we do our job right and build up relationships from pregnancy through the first, you know, year or two, at some point it would be easy for us with a relationship to just disrupt them. So the story of how we sold is just eToys became increasingly aggressive about saying we can't let you know Amazon invest in this company. We've uh, we've got to own it, and we were uh, we weren't opposed to it, uh, but it wasn't our first choice. And there were some investor ties. And I remember you know talking about all this stuff happening in in real time. I think Mark was on the road selling advertising, and our office was bursting at the seams. And we had to make a final decision on do we take this investment from Amazon or do we. Um, you know, uh, consider talking to eToys at least. And uh, I remember I was like, our boardroom was open, our one conference room. Um, they used to be called the Situation Room because uh, we took it over from a collection agency that had these curtains and would do who knows what behind uh, behind there. So I was like, wow, this is great. You know, with great karma, I can have a private conversation. And I, I walk in the room and I remember trying to dial Mark in from the road for this momentous conversation. You get around the line and I remember screaming because I – uh, kicked under the table and there was an engineer sleeping under there who had pulled an all nighter <laughs> and, uh, you know, woke him up and he was all startled. And the board was like, did he hear what we were talking about? I said, no, I think he was sound asleep. So he left the room and we really had this, you know, two hours to decide, do we just stick with Amazon or do we, uh, you know, do we consider eToys? And I think at the end of the day, we just said, you know, the fiduciary duty is like, we've got to consider this if there's a company interested in, in, um, buying them. And I remember, it really came down to the last minute. I was like, look, I can catch the last flight down to LA. We have five minutes to decide, you know, do we, do we do this or not? And we did a quick, not even a vote, a quick canvas. And the choice was, you know, hightail it down to, uh, down to LA. And I remember it was so surreal that I was literally driving, you know, 75 miles an hour to race to the airport to catch the last flight. And I had this moment where I thought, wait, is this like a candid camera thing? Did these guys put me all up to this? And we're just <laughs> going to close with Amazon. And it was literally what I thought, but of course it was, it was true, and we went down there, and eToys was actually already filed to go public. They were in the middle of their roadshow, and they, we spent, Mark then flew down to L.A., and we were in a conference room with the eToys CEO, and we spent kind of a day talking about, did this make sense? And all of a sudden, we got pretty interested because we thought, you know, we're baby, they're kids, they're e-commerce only, we do other things. We actually thought we were going to build the online Disney, that we were going to do everything for families of, of all ages, um, and uh, so then we spent the weekend um, negotiating the deal and closed it Sunday night. And they surprised their bankers at Goldman Sachs saying, hey, we've got to put off our roadshow to go public because we're buying a company, which was really unusual at the time. You got to hand it to Toby Lake, the CEO. If he thought something should happen for the business. He wasn't going to follow convention. Well, that was also our requirement. We, they initially offered to buy us after they went public with, you know, their new public currency. And we, we knew that wasn't going to be a good deal for us. 
So our big test was, you know, we'll do it with you if you postpone your roadshow and we go public together and we all, you know, benefit. And, um, yeah, they agreed to their credit. And, you know, they were, they had, I don't know, chartered the jet and were flying around to sell their IPO and came back to L.A. to, to do this, which was really, you know, massive on, on their part and obviously massive for us because we, you know, we were making a significant decision. So I, I haven't had a... Uh, the opportunity to speak with Toby yet or, or anybody at eToys. Um, and obviously, which, you know, was famously one of the higher profile uh, uh, victims of the of the dot com bubble bursting. So if, if you could just tell me a little bit about um, your time with with eToys and, and your experience with them. You know, there were really two chapters for us. The first chapter was um, one where we were operating really independently. You know, things were moving quickly. They had the the Christmas season was everything for eToys, and they had a new distribution center that was automated they were building. They were had built a new marketing team under, you know, a great new CMO, and they were launching television advertising. And so they had, they had a ton to do, and, of course, we had a ton to do. We had to, um, you know, continue with our, our store plans. So there was a period of time, more or less leading up through Christmas of, of '99, where we worked independently, and it was, um, you know, it was a good, it was a good chapter. And then, uh, you know, the second phase was one where integration needed to start happening. And I'd say that we we were pretty culturally different as organizations. We had a completely different technology stack as well, and um, you know, we operated differently and it, you know it, it was they were the buyer it was it was time to sort of put the companies together along the lines of their vision and you know Matt and I both felt like it wasn't going to be right for us and so you know that was I, I guess awkward um, but normal at the same time and you know some people left from baby center some people stayed and you know Matt and I left at that point Matt yeah, no, I think that's right. It was it kind of became, you know, I think we we thought, well, hey, we're going to sign up to build this online Disney, and then that wasn't to be, and uh, you know, and I'd say they, you know, they uh, treated us well and figured out how to keep the company going, and where where it really so it's fine that we left, where it really then went awry. Each place was, you know, they were following the Amazon strategy of just spend like crazy and hopefully make it over the the hump, you know, to sustainability, and it just, it, you know, they were spending so much and it was such a low margin. Um, industry that they just, you know, got caught up in a, in a, in a death spiral. And, um, so we had left by this point, but then very quickly, you know, we were going to take time off and then kind of think about doing a new business. Um, it became clear that they were actually going to go bankrupt. And so then we, we, lo- we tried to buy it back. Not so much because we weren't, I mean, in, in hindsight, um, as you said, the market seems pretty small then. We were just really proud of what we built. Like we just got all these incredible user stories about people who, you know, we saved their baby's life because we sent them a personalized email at the right time and their doctor had overlooked the test. So it was just a company that you could feel really good about. It's both an interesting business, but more importantly, it really touched people's lives. So we didn't want to see it go away. And there was a real chance for that to happen. So we tried to buy it out. Um, at that point, Goldman Sachs was representing eToys and they didn't want to sell anything separately. But then as things went on, um, we basically, you know, we were sort of in there um, trying to buy it and Johnson & Johnson. Thanks to all of Mark's hard work in the early days, convincing them three years ago in the, in the right. dark ages, of the, you know, that the internet was going to be important. You know, they came in and said, at this point, we did have not just a few million page views. I think we had a couple million users. Um, and so they jumped in and bought it and still own it to this day. And it's, it's actually done quite well. So the end of the chapter has been good. So you guys had apparently uh, a good enough time that you, um, you decide to take another bite together and start another company together. So um, to, to begin to wrap things up, uh, tell me a little bit about Merced Systems. Sure. Well, we we took a break for about six months after leaving eToys. This was before, you know, everything Matt just described about them going bankrupt and us trying and not succeeding to buy Baby Center back. And, you know, when that chapter ended, we just had a lot of energy and a lot of um excitement about what we had just done and you know building a business is a really fulfilling thing and we uh, learned a lot about ourselves but we also learned that we were really compatible you know we complemented each other we had different skills we had a like a foundation of trust we had 
you know, the, the same values about how we ran the, uh, the company. So we just shook hands and said, let's do another one. And we began another process of researching ideas. Yeah, we had themes and, you know, we settled on a theme of using uh, data to influence human capital. And we, we were looking for sections inside organizations, you know, big companies in this case, where, you know, data could be leveraged. And we picked the customer service function, big call centers. And, um, you know, it proved to be a, a really sound idea. We, we built a wonderful company and, you know, Matt and I both worked there for 12 years. And um, we, after 10 years, we sold it. We stayed for a couple of years at the company who bought it. And it was a good round too, although it was uh, a totally different market. Baby Center was consumer. This one was enterprise. But we joke sometimes that the one thing they had in common was labor. You know, Merced Systems was about improving customer service workforces, which is labor and Baby Center, <laughs> of course. The other side of that pun, Matt. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a good description. We don't. People seem to like to talk about baby center more because it's babies are cute and consume. People can relate to consumer companies, but we have, now, you know, I think the analytics work we did there is sort of the foundation of some of the stuff we we do today and bring it through to present day. Now, after running a couple companies together, you know, we are generally more. I speak for myself. Um, Sort of advising companies as ICO, sort of, you know, the boards are chairman of companies. And I'm also teaching entrepreneurship now at, at Stanford Business School. And actually, we're talking about some of those ideas like minimum viable product and kind of consumer insights and design thinking and lean startup and all those things that we kind of learned uh, as we went along. I'm now helping to kind of pass on to the next generation of entrepreneurs. And Mark, what, what, are you, what are you working on these days? Yeah, I'm a, a venture partner at a venture capital firm called Costa Noa. And, you know, the first uh, in investment that I played a role in was a consumer education company called Quizlet, where I was already on the board and had been an advisor and uh, sort of commensurate with that investment. There was some leadership changes and I became the interim CEO at Quizlet and did that for a little over eight months and recruited my successor, started last week, a really, really talented guy from YouTube. So um, I'm, I'm back to uh, venture partner work and you know, still reflecting on whether, you know, that's the direction I want to go or start another company. And in the meantime, Matt and I have lots of projects and things we do together. So uh, Quizlet was fun because it was my first return to consumer since Baby Center. And uh, uh, it was a, it was a joy to go back to that that part of my life. So uh, as my final question, um, th th you're, you guys are one of only a handful of times that I've had uh, – multiple people on the show at one time. So I, I, it gives me the opportunity to ask a question I've never been able to ask before. But um, having co-founders, you know, usually it's usually two people is, is so very, very common. And so I wonder if, if each, each of you could give me your thoughts on, on why co-founders is probably the way to go um, for, for entrepreneurs. What are, what are the pluses and also, what are the challenges of, of having a, a, a co-founder and having a, a partner? Sure, I'll offer two quick thoughts and then Matt, you go. One is just complementarity. You know, often, particularly in software, there's a technical and a business co-founder and you need both. Um, you, you know, those don't have to be the categories, but it often goes that way. And so, you know, you basically have two major functions covered right off the bat. So it's useful um, in number one. Number two, you know, it's a really hard thing to do to start a business. It's very emotionally volatile. You're up, you're down, um, uh, and you have to plow through it. And, you know, having a co-founder, you, know, you know, Matt and I found one person would be feeling low and pessimistic and the other person would say, hey, suck it up. We're getting through this. And you, 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 you just help each other out. There's some ballast and support and, you know, not feeling so lonely through the hard times. So those are the two things I'd say that make it a real advantageous way to go. Yeah, and I'll start one, you know, we have some of this research at Stanford, you know, because now there have been so many companies started. Um, I think like two, three, and four are the most common, you know, two and three the most. And I think somewhere between two or three are the ones that are most likely lead to success. Um, I personally think two in general works out the best because once you start getting more people, you just, it gets unstable. And with two, it really only seems to work like I think it did with Mark where we had complementary skills, but we pretty much had shared, you know, values. Like we both wanted to work the same amount. Uh, you know, we, we kind of approached the same problems. We trusted each other. 
Um, and so that's what made it work. And yeah, I'd echo personally what Mark said. Is it's just, I don't pe- think people understand how really, really hard it is to start a company, both just in terms of the sheer amount of dedication and work and the emotional roller coaster. So I do always kind of have this, you know, uh, image or analogy of like, it's great to have someone to open the doors with you in the morning and close the doors with you at night. You can have some great employees who are really dedicated and work hard, but there's just something about being a founder that puts you in it that much more. And then the second that Mark said is that you, you're always going to have ups and downs. And if you have two, you, uh, they, the waves offset each other in a good way. Well, uh, Matt Glickman and uh, Mark Selko, thank you so much for uh, coming on the show and uh, remembering those stories for us. It was a pleasure. Thanks, for, uh, thanks again for having us. Helping us revisiting the old days, yeah. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at nethistorypod, And my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.